Hi guys, Dana Biggie here, and today we're going to be doing my August reading wrap-up, aren't we, Biggie? Are you going to help me with this? Do you remember what I thought of all the books when I read them? Say hello to the internet. Oh, are we going? We're going down here. Okay. Oh, and now we're knocking the camera. Now there's a tail in the way. Biggie, can you move your ass, please? Thank you. There we go. He's sitting behind the camera now. All right, so uh, without further ado, let's jump on into it. So I started out by reading The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. I actually read this over the space of, what, a couple of days, something like that. And I really enjoyed it, actually. I gave it a four out of five. I also did a full review, which I'll link to below. There's actually reviews of quite a few of these books. And I picked it up because my girlfriend and I had watched the Hunger Games movies because they've recently come onto Netflix. I'd never seen them before. And to be honest, I think when they came out, I was probably a little bit too old for them. I was like 19 or something like that. And so, um, you know, they they kind of, to me, were like a, a... Well, they were YA. And even by then, I was reading, like, Jack Kerouac and stuff. So it wasn't really my kind of thing. And I suppose I've come full circle in many ways. But I was very kind of dismissive of it at the time. And I watched the movies, and I thought the movies were pretty good. So I picked up the book, and the book was pretty good as well. So I'm hoping to read the rest of the trilogy soon. But in the meantime, as I say, you can go down below for the link to my full review on this one. Okay, so next up we have a classic. Children's classic. C.S. Lewis, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. This is actually number two in the series if you read them uh, like chronologically as opposed to in publication order, which is just the order that the box set that I've got them in is. So I read The Magician's Nephew towards the end of last month and I've just been cracking on with Narnia throughout this month. And yeah, I actually DNF'd this when I was a kid because I just I didn't really get into it. I enjoyed it more as an adult, but actually I, I preferred The Magician's Nephew. But uh, part of it is because Edmund is just so insufferable. Although he does have a bit of a character art where he kind of redeems himself. But honestly, I, just because he was such a dick when he was a kid, I, I never really cared for him as a character. And it's kind of a pain to read about. I'm also pretty familiar with the story of this just from popular culture and then there was a movie of it a few years ago and as I say I probably probably read two thirds of it when I was a kid. But again this is another one that I have done a review of which may or may not be out yet. All of these reviews may or may not yet be out but I don't know if I say there's a review then there's either one out or it's coming so you know. But yeah, I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. It was alright, like, as I say it wasn't as good as The Magician's Nephew and also I don't know Especially since I've read some of the other ones. It just feels a bit formulaic because the same thing just keeps happening. They go travelling for a bit and then there's a big battle. And that's like every one of the books in the series. But hey-ho. Then I read Small Steps by Louis Sakar. So this is another one that I did a review of. Louis Sakar wrote Holes, which I reviewed that back in the day. So I'll link to that as well. But um, I really enjoyed Holes. I thought it was excellent. Small Steps, I think, was just as good. Possibly even better just because... In Holes, there was like a dual timeline thing going on and we learned a lot about the kind of the past and I actually didn't think it was handled particularly well. All I wanted to read about was Stanley Yelnats and the boys in the camp. Now, granted, the two timelines did come together eventually, but in this one, it's just the one timeline really. And it's uh, it doesn't follow Stanley. It follows his friend Armpit. So uh, his return to Austin, he has five goals for himself. Uh, graduate high school, get a job, save his money, avoid situations that might turn violent and lose the name Armpit. And he ends up getting involved in this this sort of scheme to become a ticket tout, effectively, with one of his mates. He ends up reluctantly p putting in the startup capital. And uh, then while they're at the concert, there's like an incident. And then he gets taken backstage and him and his friend, who's like a little girl who's ne who lives next door to him, I think has cerebral palsy or she has some form of disability anyway. And so he takes her along because she's a big fan of this pop starlet. And then they meet her and then we kind of follow what happens from there. It has an interesting ending, I thought, as well. Like, it's almost unsatisfying, but it's not, because it's realistic, I think. So, it's not a super happy ending. It's not, ev and everyone lived happily ever after, but uh, has it, it's, it's, yeah, it's certainly, it was pretty good, I thought, that ending in particular. But the book itself, I also really enjoyed. I think I gave this, like, a, a 4, 4.5 out of 5, and uh, it's in the running for my top books of the quarter as well. Okay, then we move on to the next Narnia book. So that was The Horse and His Boy by C.S. Lewis. Again, I will do, I've done a full review of this that I'll link to below. And this was dreadful. 
Uh, I gave this one a two out of five. It was just a really long slog. And after I'd, you know, the first one I really enjoyed, the second one I thought was pretty good. And then this one was just flat out bad to the point at which I was like, oh my God, I've still got four more books to go. And if they're all like this, it's not going to be fun. Spoiler alert for the later reviews. They're not all like this. It did get better. So for me so far, at least in the in the series, this was like a, a one-off blip. So yeah, not not so good. And I think part of that was that it just followed a whole new set of characters and quite a dull storyline. Then there was like a bit where it was almost an imitation of uh, The Prince and the Pauper by Mark Twain. So it just, it didn't feel very original. It didn't feel very good. It had the same thing of a long journey and a big battle at the end. It did have the characters from The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe in, but they all spoke strangely because they'd all been kings and queens for a while. So apparently they learnt, they forgot how to speak. And also, I did see some reviewers kind of call it out and say that it was racist. I don't think it was too much. It was kind of casually racist in a 1950s style way. But it wasn't malicious, I don't think. So I'm not going to give it a bad rating because it was racist. Because I don't think it particularly was, especially when, when compared to some other novels. I'm going to give it a bad rating because it was bad. Okay, then we have Stoner by John Williams. <laughs> Not the John Williams who wrote the like the Star Wars music and Jaws and all of that stuff. And this is a really beautiful edition as well. I think it's what is it? Is it a Waterstones? I think yeah. I think it was a it's a vintage classics edition made specifically for Waterstones. And uh, oh, it's just so beautiful. Um, like as an artifact and as a novel as well. I actually read this as a buddy read with Mara from Books Like Whoa, and she enjoyed it. I loved it. Um, so she was saying it's like possibly one of the most technically proficient novels she's ever read, which is certainly very true. It's almost got a, like it's got a classic classical feel to it where, you know, where you just something becomes you read it and you're like, that's going to withstand the test of time. And like, for example, Star Wars has that kind of feel to it. It's almost a timelessness. And this is like just really classic storytelling. My sign fell down. Big E, are you behind the window again? So, yeah, for me, I was reading it and I was like kept going through it and I was just like so beautiful and then by the time I got to the end of it and especially the ending was really very powerful I think uh, I just knew it was going to be a favourite of the quarter if, if not of the year so uh, and also I think what's really interesting about this is it literally follows this character Stoner from his birth through to his death so he's born uh, to like uh, a family who lives and works on a farm his parents scrape up enough money for him to go off to university and then his dad basically dies because he doesn't have enough help on the farm. Stoner becomes a teacher, but then his academic life... So there's kind of some turmoil there where basically a co-worker asks him to kind of give a pass to this, this disabled kid. And he's like, no, he's making it up. Because basically he realised that he'd like memorised stuff like specifically to pass exams and stuff and didn't actually know what he was talking about. And uh, there's also some like... There's a love interest that he has. He actually has an affair because he's also married in a very unhappy marriage uh, with a daughter as well. His daughter actually becomes an alcoholic and then he dies of cancer. So yeah, it is. It's very sad, but very moving, very poignant all the way through. I think what it does well is it's like, it shows that life isn't, you know, life is harsh. Life is a harsh mistress and Stoner doesn't have the best time of, time of things, but he does live a life that I think would be recognisable to people as quite a realistic life as opposed to what you read quite often in novels. And um, yeah, it was just wonderful. I would definitely recommend checking it out if you get the chance. Stoner was a 5 out of 5, and then that brings us on to Terry Pratchett and Stephen Baxter, The Long Earth. Again, review coming. So, so far, I think Stoner's the only one of these that there is not a dedicated review coming for. And um, this was a 5 out of 5, probably my book of the year so far, I would say. It's very hard to explain it. The blurb on it is rubbish as well, because I was basically put off reading these for a while because of the blurb, and it turns out the blurb is just misleading. So basically what happens is mankind discovers a way to, like, step between parallel galaxies so you know the whole parallel universe theory except in this all the other earths are empty and we do actually uh, learn why there are no humans on there there's no civilization on there there are some creatures though that we start to call like elves trolls kobolds i think dwarves was one uh, they don't necessarily have much in common with like their fantasy counterparts it's just used as a convenient naming system and again it's pratchett so it works pretty well uh, Baxter, I think, is responsible for a lot of the imagination and the world building here. And then Pratchett is probably responsible for a lot of the humour. I don't know how much he was even involved in the project, considering this was when it, after he'd been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and he was struggling enough to keep up with the disc world, you know? But there's just so much in this. Like, all these scientific ideas that just blew my mind. Little references, like the ship they 
create to go from uh, like parallel universe to parallel universe. They call them Mark Twain. And uh, then later they have Twains, which are named after the Mark Twain because it was like the, you know, the forerunner of all these other ships. But also they go Twain the Worlds, which I think is very cool. So, yeah, a unique book, really. I've never really read anything like this that I can think of, at least. And again, full review coming soon. It's probably going to be a whopper of a, of a review. And uh, this is the first in a five book series as well. So can't wait to read some more. Then we have Prince Caspian by C.S. Lewis. So as you can tell, I took a little bit of a break from reading the Narnia books because the horse and his boy was so bad. I'd actually planned on reading these in bed as my bedtime books because I was like, I'm not going to enjoy them. So I might as well read them a bit at a time and help, help send myself asleep. And then it came back onto fine form. So I think this is the second of like the original trilogy with the original four characters. So you've got Susan, Peter, Edmund and Lucy are all back. Prince Caspian's in it as well. They do a lot of travelling and then there's a big battle at the end as you would expect. But it was at least more enjoyable. I actually gave this a 4 out of 5. And this is a joint with The Magician's Nephew so far for my favourite books in the series. So yeah. And then I moved on to The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, again by C.S. Lewis. And uh, S uh, Peter and Susan aren't in this one because they've got too old for Narnia. But Edmund and Lucy are. And we also get a new character called, what was his name? Edmund? No, not Edmund. What am I thinking? I can't remember. Blah, blah. His name, Eustace. That was it. And uh, he's painted right from the start as being a bit of a weirdo because he's a vegetarian, which I did not like. Uh, he's also a very irritating character, similar in, in the lines of Edmund, except possibly even more irritating. So now you've got two characters I don't like in the second book. Uh, and also this is set quite often, quite a lot on a ship, uh, the Dawn Treader, so we hear a lot about poop decks. Very humorous. I think at one point there was a reference to the higher poop or something, which I was like, that sounds like, <laughs> I don't know, the god of poo, doesn't it? But uh, yeah. It was alright, it was probably, this one for me was on a par with The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, so it was a 3.5 out of 5. It wasn't as good uh, as Prince Caspian, but it was alright, and uh, it kind of gave me my mojo back and made me fairly convinced that I might actually make it to the end of the series with my sanity intact, possibly by the end of the month as well. Then, we have this cookbook, which is Students Go Vegan Cookbook by Carol Raymond, and this one I got... For I think like 50p in a charity shop so I thought well I'm getting it cheap so I can't complain too much you know there were only maybe a dozen recipes in there that I tried and I probably kept three or four of them so I probably wouldn't say to pay the full retail price for this because it, it's not really worth it for that unless you have a, an interest in like the nutritional side of the things because then there's a lot of that in there but to be honest a lot of the recipes in this was super simple it was just like how to make rice with cauliflower or something it's like you boil some rice, you fry some cauliflower and mix them together. And it's like, I could have could have got that without a cookbook, mate. So overall, I gave it a 3 out of 5. But there were some good ones in here. And uh, yeah, I'm, I can't remember which ones they were off the top of my head, though, unfortunately. There's Chinese vegetable lo mein with tofu. That was quite nice. Uh, and I should point out as well, I have a uh, vegan food channel on YouTube now. Uh, again, I will link to that below. Dane's Vegan Journey. And... So if you check that out, and also some of my reading vlogs, you'll probably see some of these recipes. Okay, and then I read The Long War by Terry Pratchett and Stephen Baxter. So this is book number two. I'll say straight away, it wasn't as good as the first one. It was still pretty good. I gave it like a 3.75 out of, out of 5. So it's like, not a bad book by any stretch. It just is nowhere near approaching favourite level. And I think part of the reason for that is, A, it's longer, and I think it meandered a bit more. Uh, but also... The first book was a good adventure novel, and then all like the sciencey bits and the references and stuff were like an added bonus. Whereas this, the adventure wasn't particularly gripping, but you still had all the sciencey bits and the references. So, and I kind of com compare that in my head to like Northern Lights and the His Dark Materials trilogy by Philip Pullman, which is a cracking adventure story, and then it makes you think as well. With then the Book of Dust, La Belle Sauvage, where I think it had a lot of the ideas in there, but it wasn't a particularly good story in in and of itself. However, I mean, I really like this concept of the Long Earth and being able to step between them. And I think the next one is the Long Mars as well, which I am quite excited about. And then there's the Long Utopia, and then there's the Long something else. I don't know. But yeah, as I say, I've been enjoying reading through these, and i got the box set of all five of them. So I, I don't think I'll have got to the end of that by the end of this month, but it's kind of helping me to have like little breaks between... Um, between these longer Pratchett ones and then going in and reading some C.S. Lewis. So 
So, uh, yes, that's what I plan to do next. But, you know, this is a mid-month instalment in this, and then I'm going to sp splice them all together at the end, because that way I can edit this in advance, and, you know, my, my wrap-up won't come out on, like, August the 29th. Wait, we're in August, September the 29th. So I'm going to hand you over to Future Dane, and hopefully he's read some crackers. Alrighty, I have two more books to talk to you about, and perhaps unsurprisingly, this is The Silver Chair and The Last Battle by C.S. Lewis. So I've now finished the Narnia series. The Silver Chair was book number six, or at least it was in the box set, the ones that I got. Um, basically, it follows Edmund, and I believe Jill was her name, as they enter Narnia. And they basically try and track down the prince, who is the son of this elderly king. The prince has been bewitched. And as usually happens in these things, there's a lot of, like, a long journey and then a battle, basically. Uh, in this one, they also meet some giants. There's a very disturbing scene where Jill, who is a, like, teenage girl, is making love to all the giants. And somebody else says they need to be as gay as possible. And then Jill starts kissing all the giantesses. But that's just, like, the archaic language that Lewis used. I'd never heard making love to mean anything other than sex before. So that really confused me and weirded me out. It wasn't as good as some of the previous entries, and I started to get a little bit bored near the end, but overall I gave it a 3.25 out of 5. And again, there's going to be a full review of this, so I'll link to it below if it's ready. And then we have The Last Battle, which uh, actually at one point it does bring together like all the previous books and all the previous characters. Unfortunately, I just found it a little bit dull. Uh, it's about basically this, this ape and this donkey... They find a lion skin, and the ape has the bright idea of putting the lion skin on the donkey, pretending he's Aslan, and then like the ape starts bossing everyone around. And then there's like a war between the Narnians and the Calamen. Uh, a lot of C.S. Lewis's sort of beliefs that it's fine to eat things if they can speak. Sorry, it's fine to eat things if they can't speak, but not if they can speak. Which presumably means it's fine to eat babies. I don't really know where... I, I, yeah, anyway... And uh, all in all, yeah, just quite a dull book. Uh, the ending was weird as well. Like, you can interpret it in different ways, I think. I don't know. I quite like my interpretation where everybody died, basically. But it, it just, it, it was kind of an unsatisfactory ending to the series. So I gave it a 2.5 out of 5. It wasn't as bad as The Horse and His Boy, but it was one of the weaker books. And, uh, yeah. But I am glad that I've finished reading all of the Narnia books. Alright, I have some more books to update you on. So next up I read The Long Mars by Terry Pratchett and Stephen Baxter. This is book number three in the series. Again, I've filmed a review of this, so I'll link below if it's ready. And what was cool about this one is while the first two books focused on, like, stepping technology and this idea of going between parallel worlds on our Earth... In this one, they kind of mount a space mission to Mars and then find out that you can step on Mars and so they start exploring the long Mars. And I really like the idea as well. Basically, the way this mission works, there's um, a world called The Gap where basically the Earth was destroyed and they figured out that it's actually easier to launch a, a space mission from there because, you know, there's no... They don't have to use gravitational... They, blah, because they don't have to, like, battle gravitational force to blast off from a planet. They literally, they just step and they're in space. So they go to Mars and then start stepping across Mars as well. And yeah, it was it was pretty cool. I think that at this point, like, the, the series has kind of settled in for me now. So the first book I really enjoyed. And now, by this point, I'm still enjoying it. But it's just kind of okay, you know. And I will continue reading. But I don't know, I think... A lot of the ideas are starting to get repeated, and so when they felt really fresh in the first book, even transposed to the setting of Mars, I don't know. We also get introduced to the next in this, which is like a race of super intelligent super beings, which I thought was pretty cool. So there is a lot to talk about in this, and a lot, you know, going for it as a book, but it just wasn't as good as the first one, and I think it even wasn't quite as good as the second one, so I gave it a 3.5 out of 5, it was fine, but it wasn't, you know, mind-blowing. Then I read You Have to Fucking Eat by Adam Mansback, illustrated by Owen Brosman. So this is like a children's book for adults. He also wrote a book called Go the Fuck to Sleep. And um, Samuel L. Jackson narrated the audiobook as well, so I'll link to that below. Because you can listen to that in like 10 minutes. And uh, as I say, it's a children's book for adults. So I'm going to read you the first couple of pages and show you the illustrations. The sunrise is golden and lovely. The birds chirp and twitter and tweet. You woke me and asked for some breakfast. So why the fuck won't you eat? The bunnies are munching on carrots. The lambs nibble grasses and bleat. 
I know you're too hungry to reason with, but you have to fucking eat. Let's do one more. Your cute little tummy is rumbling, and pancakes are your favourite treat. I'm kind of surprised that you suddenly hate them. That's bullshit. Stop lying and eat. So yeah, made me chuckle. Four out of five. I mean, yeah, I just, I, I quite like those books, so I kind of want to collect them because there's about four of them. Next up we have Little People, Big Dreams by Agatha Christie. This is written by Isabel Sanchez Vegara, illustrated by Eliza Munso. And I saw this on Brian's Bookshelves Instagram and I thought it looked awesome, so I had to get it. And it didn't disappoint me. It's very cute and obviously aimed at kids, but it teaches you about Agatha Christie and her life. Again, I'll read you the first couple of pages. Little Agatha and her mum read a book together every afternoon. Agatha always had a better idea for how the story should end. In bed, Agatha went on reading until she fell asleep. Detective novels were her favourite. But then a war started and young Agatha had to put her books aside. It was time for her to help wounded soldiers in a hospital. So yeah, it's just very cool. There's also like a whole series of these. So I know there's a Frida Kahlo one. There's a Stephen Hawking one. Uh, actually, let's have a look. Who else is there? Coco Chanel, Maya Angelou, Amelia Earhart, um, Mary Curie, Rosa Parks. Emmeline Pankhurst and Audrey Hepburn. Well, these are all women, so I don't know whether it started out as all women. Because I'm sure I saw a Stephen Hawking one. Anyway, yeah, would recommend. Four out of five. Very cool. I just have one more to mention here. This is Shoplifting from American Apparel by Tao Lin. And this is a novella. It's got a very simple line on the back here. The inmate with a mop held back the inmate without a mop. And that's quite characteristic of Towlin's writing. He definitely has a writing style that not everybody will enjoy. And he's kind of like a Marmite figure. People either love him or they hate him. I wouldn't say I love him, but I do enjoy his work. And I plan to like slowly work my way through it. And this like, it's his kind of version of On the Road. So it follows his own life in like a semi-fictional account of a couple of years as him as like a minor celebrity writer, I guess you could call him. Uh, and yeah, there's lots of mentions of vegan food, which made me hungry throughout it. And as I say, I just really enjoy Towlin's writing style. So even though this is one of those books where there isn't really a plot, it's a very like meandering story, mo mostly focusing on like Towlin's own philosophy and the, the characters, I guess, and what they get up, and kind of what they get up to. But um, yeah, I enjoyed it. And because it's only 100 odd pages long, I think it's not a bad little introduction to his work as well. A nice little novella. So I gave it a four out of five. Yo, 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 what up, my homies? I am back with three more books to talk about. So the first one I have here is Porno by Irvin Welsh. So I read this as a bedtime book. It was actually for my My Cat Picks My TBR video. So I'll link below. You can check that out. And basically, this is the sequel to Train Spotting. If you've seen the movie T2. It's basically the novel that that movie was based on. And in it, we sort of see what happens. I don't know about what, 10 years on, yeah, from Train Spotting. Uh, Simon, sick boy, has decided he's going to shoot a porno and he starts recruiting people to join him. Renton ends up putting to some money towards financing it and that sort of thing. And uh, we've got Juice Terry is in it as well. Begbie is in it. Uh, he's, he's after Renton because Renton stole money from him at the end of Train Spotting. And so it's just pretty cool to go and kind of hang out with those characters again. No, you know, they are crazy, but it's okay because I'm reading about them, so it's safe. Uh, now, I will say this is like 480 pages, my edition, and Goodreads says it's 600 pages, which might explain why the print is so tiny. And also a lot of it's written in Scottish dialect. One of the good things about it is that we go from different points of view, though, so it's not all in Scottish dialect. It really depends upon the character. And that also allows us to see the storyline from these different points of view, and we get some like dramatic irony. But also, you know, we get to really see not just how people react differently to the same situation, but how they think differently as well. I mean, Irvin Welsh's stuff, the characters are always super well defined and super realistic. And he just did another great job here. I will say I think it helped that I read this slowly as well because it almost then made the novel feel as though it was unfolding in real time as I was reading it. But overall, I really enjoyed it. I love Irvin Welsh's stuff and I'm, you know, looking forward to getting to more. I think I've read about eight already. One other thing to mention is that my favourite Irvin Welsh novel is Marabou Stalk Nightmares. So I'd probably recommend that one, especially... Well, I guess if you're new to him, you can always just pick up Trade Spotting as well and then see if you fancy carrying on with this. But uh, yeah, it is what it is. I gave it four out of five. 
Then I finished reading The Long Utopia by Terry Pratchett and Stephen Baxter. I still have many of the same complaints as I have for like the last couple of these really, which is that the first one was so good that the rest of the series has struggled to hold up to it. But they are working pretty well as standalone novels as well. In this one we get like a world, like a version of our Earth that's spinning faster and faster and faster as well. And we get a lot of like the underlying science of what that leads to, which I thought was very cool. Again, I'll have filmed and shot a full review of this one. I'm actually like halfway through it, which is why I only have half the tabs here. But um, yeah, it was, it was okay. It was a 3.5 out of 5. Pretty average, to be honest. I don't think I would have been like carrying on with the series past this point if Terry Pratchett's name wasn't attached to it. But the first one I did think was very, very good. So yeah, I'm looking forward to reading the next one and finishing off the series. And then we have Bish Bash Bosh by Henry Firth and Ian Theesby. So uh, these are the guys behind Bosh, which is like a vegan YouTube channel, but they also have an Instagram and other stuff where they share recipes and whatnot. If you're looking for vegan YouTube channels, by the way, shout out to Dane's Vegan Journey, which is my other new second channel, which has got loads of vegan stuff in, including like me making some of these recipes, I guess. Uh, they've also been featured in like my reading vlog, so if you like the food I've been making there, a lot of that's probably come from this. And for me, with recipe books, I don't consider them to be read until I've tried all the recipes I want to try. So not necessarily every recipe in the book. I'll go through a recipe book when I get it and pick out the recipes that I want to do. And so that's what I did with this. And yeah, I was pretty impressed. It was like a 4.25 out of 5. Probably has an edge over the first one of their cookbooks as well. And I think they're coming out with like a new lifestyle uh, you know, how to live vegan, uh, how and why to live vegan book coming out either soon or maybe even now. So I'll, I'll probably check that out. It was a birthday present and it's actually the, the signed edition as well. And it comes with a few bonus recipes, six exclusive recipes. Very cool. All right, so just got one more book to update you on, and this is Fox News Fuckfest by Mandy DeSandra, uh, which is a pseudonym. I actually know the you know the author behind Mandy DeSandra, I guess. And this is like bizarro erotica slash political satire. Basically, the liberals poison the water at Fox News, and the water makes everybody have like orgies and all these sexual fantasies and stuff. You do have lots of like really weird sex. Uh, including a bit towards the end where it all gets televised, which was quite impressive. And a cameo from a familiar face while well, he's there. Donald Trump was in it at the end. Uh, but it's not like... It's neither left-wing nor right-wing, I guess. Is that what you call it? Left-wing or central? I don't know what the American terms are. But, um, like, DeSandra doesn't really have any political obje objectives. She actually says in the introduction um, that she just enjoys politics the way the Joker enjoys crime. It's like a... A mean to an end, you know. He just, she just wants to cause trouble. So this is definitely for people aged 18 plus. And if you don't have like a strong stomach for erotica, then you probably won't enjoy it. But there were also some like, just some of the um, similes and metaphors in this were just hilarious as well. I'm gonna try and find one. See, uh, there are just like great little lines like this. I'm trying. I was trying to find one that's like safe for the whole family, but um, and I don't know who this guy is, but. Brett Byer was delivering the news with his usual sobriety. He was not under the effect of the liberal deviant drug water. In between commercials, he had his normal Perrier water, which he was chided for because it was pro-French. Lots of little jabs like that. So yeah, uh, I enjoyed this. I gave it a 3.75 out of 5. Okay, so I finished reading The Long Cosmos by Terry Pratchett and Stephen Baxter. This was a 3 out of 5 for me and kind of a lackluster ending to the series for me really but there are reasons for that so Baxter actually writes an introduction and he sort of explains Pratchett passed away before it was edited so he did the editing alone and also when they originally conceived it basically they thought of the plot for the first book that became so huge they had to split it up into two books then they kind of couldn't resist writing about the long Mars so that's where book three came from and then they just sort of rounded off the series so I feel as though it would have been better if they just ended with the long Mars or even like that first one would have been a really good standalone if they'd not had the weird ending, which I guess makes sense more in the context if you think of it as being two books, but still. Uh, that was my only like criticism of the first book, really. But yeah, I found myself kind of zoning out a lot with this and not really caring about the characters. A lot of them were dead as well, like the ones who were my favourites from early on in the series are dead by this point, or they're old and kind of useless. Uh, we did learn some more about the nature of the Long Earth, and there was a kind of open ending that I liked, I guess. 
But all in all, I wouldn't recommend reading this one unless you've like worked your way to this point in the series, in which case, sure, go ahead and finish it. But definitely book one, The Long Earth, in this uh, series was the best one. So three out of five from me. Okay, I have, I think, four more books to update you on. We'll try and get these in order. So uh, first off, here we have, uh, this is by, oh, let's see if I can remember, no, I can't remember his name, Eldegard Peach, uh, Charles Darwin, Lives of the Great Scientists. This is a ladybird book. So these are like designed for kids and like published back in the sort of 70s. But you see them around in charity shops every now and then. And I pick them up because I'm sort of slowly building a collection. This one is obviously about Charles Darwin. It, it, it almost feels a little bit outdated because I think it was trying to please people who were like creationists and stuff and who disagreed with Darwin. But again, it was published back in the 70s. I think that probably is part of it. Like the writing style is a bit different as well. But all in all, I mean, the subject matter is interesting. I'm really interested in Darwin. I think these Lady Bird books are super cute, even because they're like their little illustrations and stuff. Very informative. Would be good if you have a kid who's into or interested in Darwin. I give it like a 3.5 out of 5. Then I read Rommel Gunner Who, A Confrontation in the Desert by Spike Milligan. This is the second one of his war journals. So there's a lot of like really racist stuff in this. He uses, I'm not even going to say the term because it's very racist, but a derogatory term for black people. Uh, that begins with the letter W. He uses that a lot in here, but again, like he was, well, he was serving in the Second World War, so I guess he was born in like the twenties, and then this was published in like the seventies. So he was kind of an old man, and even then, at the time, I think it would have been considered quite racist. So if you can overlook that, I mean, like I don't think there's any real malice in it. So for example, one of his fellow soldiers was complaining about all of the black soldiers around them. And then Spike pointed out, like, they're the only thing between us and the Germans, you know. But um, I liked all of, like, the historical context and the occasional one-liners here and there were good. I find him to be more miss than hit, but I can put up with the misses for the hits, if that makes sense. And I was saying to myself, I think, like, his war diaries, I'll probably will read them all throughout the course of my lifetime, but I don't think I'll ever reread them. So I gave this one, like, a probably, like, a 3.25 out of 5. Only really of interest if you're interested in, like, the Second World War. Then we have Insomnia by Stephen King, and I don't want to say loads about this because I filmed a full separate review of it and also talked about it for my, my Cat Picks My TBR video. Basically, this one, although it's called Insomnia and like the Insomnia is kind of the inciting incident for this character, he basically starts to see auras and like trying to change the future and all of this stuff. And um, yeah, I mean, it was... It was good, it just didn't really relate back to Insomnia that much. It was also, like, at times it slowed down and then you'd suddenly speed up and, like, for, like, 50 pages, loads of stuff would be happening. For me, I think the main interest in this was the fact, A, it's set in Derry, which is where it was set in various of King's other books. And also there are a lot of times with the Dark Tower series, like, literally Roland is in a scene in this at one point, And there's a lot of talk about car and all of this stuff. So I think that means it's not really ideal for you if you're new to King. You really want to read the Dark Tower series at least, and pref preferably like some of his other well-known books. But like if you're a King completionist, or even if you're just reading through them all in order, definitely check them out. And if the review is out by now, I'll link to the video for that below. And uh, yeah, like a 3.25 out of 5. And that brings us on to this, which is Such Such Were the Joys by George Orwell. This is just like a short penguin, uh, like essays published in this little book. Uh, it's only like 56 pages long and it's all about Orwell's time like in a public school and a boarding school. There's a few bits about homosexuality and all this kind of stuff, kind of the culture of it. To be honest, I'm not really interested in that kind of stuff. I mean, it, especially these days, it kind of smacks of privilege, you know what I mean? And so it doesn't, it's not nice to read, it's like not interesting to read about. I, I, I know, and I can't relate to it because it's nothing, nothing like my own life. So, but yeah, I gave it like a... 3.25 out of 5 again. It was alright, but um, definitely there are more interesting or well essays out there. So I have Pulp Fiction by Quentin Tarantino. Obviously, this is the screenplay of the movie. It's a fantastic movie, and the screenplay was just as good and just as much fun to read. There's also plenty of like photos or like stills from the movie, but also like scenes that were removed or replaced or rewritten. And in the cases where they use the different version, they present both versions so that you can kind of see what it was going to be and what it became. I read this in a day and then watched the movie afterwards and I gave it a 4.5 out of 5. It's very difficult to fault it really. I mean, I really enjoy reading screenplays anyway because I studied screenwriting. So 
you know, maybe you wouldn't enjoy it as much if you, if you don't like screenplays or if you're not a fan of the movie. But otherwise, can't go wrong. Then I followed that up with Night by Eli Weisel. I think I said that right. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to be doing a full review of this, uh, like a later date. Basically, this is non-fiction about the Holocaust. It's actually part one of a trilogy, which I didn't realise as well. There's also Dawn and Day. And it's basically Weisel's memoirs of his time in like Auschwitz-Birkenau. And uh, where else did he go later as well? He went somewhere else. Uh, Buchenwald, that was it. He ended up in Buchenwald. And there's like this awful moment where he was ill and if he'd stayed behind in the hospital, he would have been uh, liberated. But they, they went to Buchenwald instead. And uh, yeah, but you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know what to do in those circumstances. Like they thought that if they stayed behind, they'd just be killed. So they thought it was better to face this sort of death march. And this death march reminded me of The Long Walk by Stephen King as well. So yeah, 4.5 out of 5. Very important book. I think everyone should read and I'll be reading the other two as well. And then the last one that I have to report back on for this month is The Dogs of Humanity by Colin Dardis. This was sent to me by Isabel Kenyon, who is the editor of Fly on the Wall Press, who published this. And this is like a chapbook of poetry. I think the best way really is to just read you a couple. So I'm going to read you... What was that one? I think I did seem to recall liking this one. I was going to... 13 Ways of Looking at a Sparrow. If you challenge a sparrow directly, its friends will conspire to sully your washing line, car, jacket, whatever is most convenient. Sparrows love to be told that they are handsome. Complimenting a sparrow on Midsummer's Day will bring you wealth. Sparrows hate poetry. They do, however, like Archer's fan fiction, written exclusively by middle-class retirees. You must believe in the sparrow before you can see it. The sparrow must believe in you before it allows you to see it. Some sparrows are actually pigeons in disguise with identity crises. Sparrows believe that photographs capture part of their soul and so have craftily learnt to avoid the lens. Seeing a sparrow's shadow on April 13th is a sign of six more weeks of spring. Aspiring sparrows are often headhunted. Unfortunately, this is mostly always by sparrow hawks. Holding the feather of a sparrow in your mouth while lovemaking is an ancient fertility rite. The reason cats and sparrows don't get along dates back to the Great Class War of 1847. Pigeons are secretly jealous of the sparrow's mellifluous song. Sparrows in turn are openly jealous of starlings. The collective noun for sparrows is a franchise grocery store at your local garage of sparrows. I'll read one other one, short one. This is Bark Ruff Arf Ow Ow Bow Wow Yip. And I should point out, like this is mostly sort of dog themed poetry as well, hence the title. I cannot come to you, little dog. I cannot heal your barking with poison or shut my ears no matter how many doors and windows I close. I am not your owner or even a lover of dogs, not wanting a kiss or a cuddle in the way so many lonely people do. All your words sound the same, an angry repetition, born out of solitude and neglect. I have cried the same tune, spoken to the same dead air, and waited for the knock, the name, the car engine, that familiar note that only rings within the past. So yeah, I really enjoyed this poetry collection. I gave it a 4 out of 5, and would recommend, especially if you're into sort of, more sort of, I suppose, experimental free verse, modern poetry, that sort of thing. Good stuff. And so yeah, that is it for this month's wrap up. So as always, let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.